Right. Thank you all for coming. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, this is really cool to see faces from many years ago and recent years, and this is just really great, great to sit up here and see you all. Um, the reason we're here today, uh, there are several reasons. Uh, uh, this uh, in particular is hopefully the start of an annual event. It's a uh, lecture in applied physiology. And I'd like to, first of all, um, acknowledge uh, the, the support from um, Craig and Joy Lynch uh, Endowment Fund, which is uh, meeting you all today. Uh, and it's also um, providing um, support for uh, one of our graduate students this year. Uh, is Robin here? Robin Rackery? Okay, so she's off doing research, apparently. <laughs> um, uh, she's one of Lewis Wheaton's uh, PhD students, first year student. Um, and this is part of the uh, Lynch uh, um, gift was to help uh, support folks doing in particular uh, research in applied physiology um, with some, um, um, I guess, leanings towards uh, prosthetics and orthotics research. Um, so Robin, I'll just give you a quick rundown. She's um, working on upper extremity uh, external prostheses, so artificial arms and that sort of thing. Um, the, the, one of the big issues in upper extremity um, prosthetics is that the technology is fantastic, but there's a high rejection rate. So folks with amputations get these great pieces of technology and then they don't use it. Um, and it's often because it's um, deemed to be not functional or a, a, a sort of a personal preference of the, of the user. And so what Robin is working on is looking to study new um, sensory motor learning models uh, to determine the best way to introduce artificial sensory inputs like haptic or proprioceptive feedback from the device to the person. So looking at neural interfaces with um, and the best learning models to, to help people um, adopt these new technologies. Okay. So thank you again to the Lynch Foundation for supporting Robin's work and for today's uh, lecture. Um, I also want to quickly thank some folks. Uh, Sandra Turner is around here somewhere. She's did all the catering uh, uh, organization for that. So I just want to just shout out and thank her. Melody Motoresi, uh, sorry, she's one of my students. I should know her name. Uh, <laughs> Melody, <laughs> Melody is uh, helping with all the AV and making sure everything's working right. Uh, so thank you. And Chase Rock is on Zoom to make sure we are uh, moderating the chat. So thank you again. Um, and last but not least, Mindy uh, Millard Stafford is around here. She was my partner in crime and in, in sort of pulling all of this together. And I just want to thank her for, for all of that as well. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Tim Cope, who will come up and introduce our speakers. <laughs> hey, everybody. We're here to celebrate Thomas Richard Nichols today. Richard is one of my oldest friends, and I've known him for a long time. <laughs> so we'd go through his academic travel log. He started his college degree, uh, his college career at Brown University, where he got a bachelor's degree, a uh, bachelor of science. It was SCB. What do they call it there? Some, you know, uh, Northeastern sort of yeah. nomenclature. Uh, a bachelor in biology, a bachelor's degree in biology from Brown University. And then he went on to Harvard where he got a degree in physiology. Now, after that, he was, he had a couple of stops. He was a research scientist, you know, kind of a glorified postdoc uh, at um, first at Alberta, in Alberta, University of Alberta in Edmonton. And then he went to Johns Hopkins in Baltimore and he went back and forth very quickly there. And I think the explanation is that uh, the science wasn't going so great in Edmonton. So he left Edmonton. But he quickly returned because the, the relationship that he was building with Patricia was going fantastic. <laughs> so, and I've got, uh, let's see. There we go. Okay, so here's just a couple of pictures. Here we've got Patricia and we've got Richard and we've got uh, their two sons. We've got Sean over here and Gareth here. 
And that's one of their three grandchildren. So you, you can see that they uh, the Edmonton experience uh, an experiment worked out very well. <laughs> okay. All right, then. So on to the tenure track faculty career. Uh, he started out at the University of Washington in their kinesiology department. And that's where we met each other 43 years ago. Uh, then he moved from there to Emory University. He was there for 24 years, and he went through the ranks there. He was an assistant, an associate, and a full professor over a 24-year peri 24 period of time. And in the last two years you were there, you were the acting chair of the department. And then you moved here in 2007 uh, to take on the, the position of chair of the School of Applied Physiology, which he held until, he, until 2016, when he became a professor in the uh, School of Biological Sciences here. All right. So your academic accomplishments go on and on. You have nearly 100 primary research articles in prestigious journals. Yes, Journal of Neurophysiology is a prestigious <laughs> journal. <laughs> um, and uh, damn the impact factors. And... Uh, <laughs> And uh, you've been invited uh, to give reviews and, and uh, to write reviews and to present chapters uh, on over more than 20 occasions. Um, you've been continuously funded for 40 years. That's a really amazing accomplishment, primarily NIH uh, and on occasion other agencies, including the Veterans Administration. Uh, you've trained 30 pre and postdoctoral students. I see many of them are here. Um, uh, and when, whenever you uh, go into Richard's laboratory, uh, when they're doing an experiment, you're going to find some visiting professor or another or some undergraduate student or another. So you have a constant flow of people just in and out of your lab. You're dedicated to teaching undergrads, graduate students, and medical students. In fact, you really never stop talking about your work. <laughs> and uh, and uh, the right enticement and the right stimulus, uh, Richard will go on and on forever. It was to see one of this. Uh, 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 <laughs> you see uh, uh, one of our collaborators right here who he's holding hostage. <laughs> and uh, that, that was at our house. I don't know how late that went, a long time. But anyway, this is Tom Ablu here in the picture, and he's, he's also in the audience. All right, then. So, um, and I, I need to mention that he's been uh, an invited speaker at numerous international meetings. At one of those meetings, I was there and I came into the reception room and I confronted this really, you know, um, famous neuroscientist. Her name's Brenda Bigland Ritchie. And she looks at me and she says, Well, hello, Dick. <laughs> and I said, well, you're either upset with me or you're confusing me for Richard Nichols. <laughs> and that's, that's not hard to do. We have about the same hairline, right? <laughs> so uh, that's a true story. So uh, his research theme. Uh, Richard focuses on how proprioception, proprio-sensory information is processed by brainstem and neural and by circuits in the brainstem and the spinal cord to produce purposeful movements and to adjust movement to environmental situations. Um, in contrast to others that focus, that focus solely on the nervous system and then try to make guesses about what that means for movement behaviors, Richard starts out with the behavior itself and he draws his inferences about underlying circuit properties and operations on the basis of those observations. He applies wide-ranging methods. Oh, sorry, uh, his findings bring critical relevance to understanding neuromechanics in healthy animals as well as animals who have uh, suffered some trauma to the nervous system. Example: spinal cord injury. We have uh, two people up front here who have uh, performed that work, uh, as well as uh, trauma to the peripheral nervous system. Okay, how do Richard's friends think about his science and his other talents? I would place Richard's contributions in line with Sherrington, Laporte and Lloyd, Eccles, and, um, and Anders Lumber. I think you're next in that line. I think that is definitely the lineage and that's, the, that's a level of contribution that you've made to this field. Richard is deeply committed to the discipline of physiology, 
uh, physiology since I've known him has always been the thing he was just absolutely committed to. Physiology, for those in the, in the audience who uh, maybe don't think about it as much, the way I think about it is simply function. It's function. And that's, that's something that he's uh, done everything that he can at a variety of levels, uh, committee levels, et cetera, et cetera, to promote the field of physiology. Uh, in addition to that, uh, oh, and I should say before I leave that point that he was recently elected as fellow to the uh, um, to the American the what's the American Physiological Society APS. Yeah, too, too many too many alphabet supers there. Um, in addition, he's also a neuroscientist. He's a kinesiologist. He's a version of a of a mechanical engineer, and he's a historian. For those of you who haven't taken his courses or stepped into his office and seen all the books on the shelves, um, uh, I'll let you know that that is the case. He's truly a, a historian in his field. He applies wide-ranging methods, including engineering principles, modeling, pharmacology, electrophysiology. And, um, and so these are the sorts of things that come to mind when we think about what you've brought to the field. Other talents. He is an artisan with woodworking. Um, he, uh, the furniture that he makes, the artistic uh, rails that he makes in stairwells. Um, we've gotten one of the jewelry, jewelry boxes that you made for us. And he also makes uh, musical instruments. Not only does he make musical instruments, um, stringed in instruments and, um, and flutes, but he's also a musician himself. And um, I can also say that he is, uh, let's see. Wine connoisseur. <laughs> <laughs> now, most of us know Richard is a very gentle person, but he can be pushed too far. <laughs> and I've done everything I can over 43 years <laughs> to, to see that that was done. <laughs> and if, if this were a little different occasion, we could tell some of those stories. <laughs> okay, then. So for all of those who know Richard, we recognize him foremost for his generosity, for his respect, and his compassion for people, uh, no matter who they are. That's the, all the hallmark of, uh, of who Richard Nevins is. And I see a lot of you shaking your heads up and down. There's no one who hasn't benefited from his care uh, and, uh, and, and had him as a role model for the way, the way to treat people with respect and generosity. So I don't know what to say. But living up to all of that is going to be difficult. Thank you, Tim. I really appreciate that. Really good friend for a long time. Okay. Um, so, where to start? Um, so I'm now currently in the School of Biological Sciences. Probably all of you, most of you know that in uh, 2016, the School of Applied Physiology was merged with the School of former School of Biology to form the School of Biological Sciences. And uh, so at the moment, we constitute a program in physiology, uh, which is a PhD program, and hopefully soon to be getting to be a master's program as well. Uh, but I'd just like to... Um, to compliment uh, Dr. Streelman, who's in the back of the room there, and many of the new colleagues that we have as a result of this merger, many new uh, colleagues and friends that have been uh, made this a very, very nice experience. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. <clears throat> also, if, uh, if Lewis Wheaton is around somewhere, Lewis, maybe in the stratosphere somewhere, he might take exception to my use of the term understand in reference to the spinal cord. Uh, he's our cognitive neuroscientist, and of course, understanding is one of those big brain things, right? But I hope to explain to you what I mean by that. And um, 
I'm hoping at the very last, well, I'll try to redeem myself. But so here's the, Uh, there's, uh, let's see. Oh. Which, what did you do? I was looking up there, so I was using this. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, this is a, a bit of a chunk of stuff, but it sort of lays out the major thesis that I'm trying to uh, get across. So. It's a truism to say that our nervous systems and our bodies evolved in the context of the environment that we're in. So the fact of the matter is that the central nervous system was just responsible for overseeing everything in the body, or most of it anyway, um, has to represent somehow the, um, the, uh, the properties of the body itself, as well as the environment that we're, we're sitting in. And, Unlike what we saw 20, 30, 40 years ago, where scientists tend to be somewhat siloed, the modern um, cohort of researchers has taken all three of these factors into account. Um, in doing work on the nervous system to understand it, you have to do it in the context of all of these, of these other two um, factors, the properties of the body itself and the properties of the environment. And I'd like to say that the work of the program faculty in applied physiology reflects this synthesis. In fact, the first part of my talk is going to be an extended acknowledgement of my colleagues in the program in physiology um, and to prove the point, not only to acknowledge them in the first place, but to prove the point that what they do is actually along the, these, this theme itself. So we can start out with um, Ed Baylog studies the molecular basis of muscle activation. Actually, the, the, the interface between the nervous system and our muscles. Uh, Tim Cope, who, uh, uh, as we just related, a dear friend from many, 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 many years ago. We've been through a lot together. It's been a really a great ride. Uh, cellular basis of neuromechanical circuits and plasticity. These are just very brief descriptors. They don't do justice to what these people do, but obviously uh, we're just skimming across the top here. Um, Boris Prelutsky, a longtime colleague, um, sensory feedback in locomotion biomechanics. Uh, Shino, Monaro Shinohara, motor learning, aging, autonomic nervous system, and a host of other interests. Young He Chang, who I had the privilege of having him in my laboratory as a postdoc some time ago, he actually challenged my work. And I said, why don't you come down to Atlanta and we'll figure out who was right. And I think we made a bet that we'd buy each other a mm -hmm. case of beer or a bottle of scotch or something. We never resolved the, uh, the thing, but <laughs> actually he took the data. We didn't know what to do with the data, what to do with the data. He brought it to Atlanta when Bob Greger hired him. And he actually turned this into a whole new area of research that had to do with the hierarchical con control of, mo of the motor system. Pardon? Yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah, yeah. Robert Greger, founding chair of the School of Applied Physiology, now retired, he's emeritus. Again, somebody who's combined study of movement with neural control. Uh, Bob is a really old friend. We've collaborated extensively and um, known him for a, a great uh, amount of time. But the founding of the School of Applied Physiology, which kicked all of this off, is just um, really historic. Simon Sponberg, who has a major uh, appointment in the School of Physics, studies the physics of movement and neuromechanics and in insect navigation, which is really fascinating. Uh, Greg Sawicki is primary in mechanical engineering is interested in motor and muscle physiology and also wearable robotics. Lewis Wheaton, our cognitive neuroscientist, interested in motor skill acquisition and rehabilitation, and has had a special interest in um, amputation and the acquisition of knowledge to, um, to use prosthetic devices. Mindy Millard Stafford, 
She was the associate chair of the School of Physiology. When, uh, when I was chair, the two of us kind of ran the school and her contributions to our group are just um, uh, immense. She's, in, she's an exercise physiologist and works with, on fluid balance and also collaborates with Lewis on cognition. Eddie Field Fote. Eddie Field Fote is uh, director of spinal cord injury research at the Shepherd Center. Uh, she is also the director of a dual degree program that, that we have with the uh, Division of Physical Therapy at Emory to train physical therapy students after they get their DPT degree to get a PhD degree, as well as a, a long standing um, a record of, of research in, um, in spinal cord injury. Arena Belarzova, who has uh, come to us fairly recently from Arizona, a world-class physiologist and neuroscientist studies neural control of whole body movement. And we are just fortunate to have her with us. Yeah, oh, sorry. Lavio Fenton in uh, primary in the School of Physics is a cardiac physiologist and a modeler, incredibly brilliant uh, scientist. And also Paul, Paul Nardelli, he's a research scientist here, who works with Tim Cope and is an expert in um, cellular physiology and sensory motor interactions. And Alexander Klischko, who is, uh, works with Boris Berlutsky um, and collaborates with him on the study of locomotion mechanics and sensory feedback. Although this is primarily a research talk, I really have to, to, uh, to acknowledge our fantastic uh, teaching staff who um, uh, teaching faculty, excuse me, who uh, impart a lot of the information that we're talking about, as well as our very large wellness course, uh, Teresa Snow, principal academic professional, who uh, basically has run the wellness course for as long as I can remember. Adam Decker, um, um, anatomical sciences, and also teaches in the wellness course. Christy Stewart, senior academic professional. Michelle Rosebrook, a senior lecturer and our two newest uh, members of the teaching faculty, Leslie Bardell and, and Sasha McBurse. And finally, the Division of Physical Therapy at Emory University. Uh, these folks have been uh, longstanding uh, colleagues. Uh, some of them are not pictured here for lack of room, but uh, we have Michael Borich, Tricia Kesar, Mark Lyle. Mark was actually a former postdoc of mine who is now carrying on some really fabulous work over there. Lena Ting, who is a principal appointment in biomedical engineering, has been a colleague for many, many years and has had a tremendous influence in the field. Steve Wolf, who is a world-class researcher on stroke rehabilitation, who also, when we had a training grant teaching our students um, in rehabilitation research, he would come over here every single week and join with our students to teach them and to uh, and actually took them on a tour of the anatomy facility at, at Emory once. And then there's this person down here um, who um, is a very close colleague of mine. <laughs> uh, Patricia um, trained legions of physical therapy students teaching them, but also directing their research in single muscle fiber mechanics for many years and in fact uh, for well over a decade was a major player in one of our core physiology courses, uh, integrative physiology courses. So she actually worked at both at Tech and, and at Emory. So I think you can see, uh, I was originally charged by the then Dean, uh, Gary Schuster, that he'd like to see applied physiology grow, but he also wanted us to start to have some connections to elsewhere in the city and in other programs on campus. And I think I've illustrated the fact that we've, we have done that. Um, we have some former members of the Applied Physiology Program, um, which are still affiliated. And I, I, I have um, Linda Roscoff should be, uh, should be uh, listed here. Thomas Burke, Burkholder and Young Jang. And also with the MSPO program, Geza Kogler, who is now at Kennesaw State University and Kinsey Heron, who has an appointment in mechanical engineering. Okay, I better get going here. Um, so let me get a little bit into the science and uh, I'm gonna try to summarize a thread of ideas, not everything that, that uh, we've been able to do, but a thread of ideas 
uh, that have emerged over the past uh, actually almost 50 years of, of research. And I wanna start out with this slide, which is from uh, Vern Inman, who is a biomechanics professor um, who wrote a really wonderful book on human walking in 1981. I actually start out many of my lectures with this slide because it really takes one from the understanding of a simple idea of locomotion where you just alternate movements of two muscles and, and two joints to a much more complex scenario. And I just wanted to lay the foundation for what I wanna talk about with this slide. So this is uh, Inman's uh, beautiful pictorial uh, depiction of uh, the human walking step cycle, where as you can imagine, the muscles are colored in shades of red corresponding to how much they're actually activated uh, during the step cycle. And I wanna concentrate on the uh, uh, contributions of three muscles in particular. So starting with this guy up here, uh, this is a hip flexor muscle that when you go from the stance phase to the swing phase, this muscle contracts, shortens, and it kicks the leg forward. And so under those conditions, that muscle is acting to generate force and to produce movement. And then what happens is not a lot goes on in here. And guess why? Because the inertial properties of the limb help to carry the leg forward. And then at the end of the swing phase, when the foot is beginning to come down before weight acceptance, this muscle back here, it's a, a retractor of the lower limb, starts to come on, and its purpose is not to create movement in a new direction. It will do that eventually, but the first thing that it does is cause this piece of equipment that's flinging through the air with this tremendous momentum, it's causing it to decelerate. And so its primary function here is as a brake, a spring-like brake. And, and then it actually becomes uh, uh, activated a little bit later to uh, produce propulsion. But its main function in the human, at least, is for, um, for this braking action. Then this muscle down here, the, the gastrocnemius muscle, which is an ankle extensor, it's this muscle in your calf, it comes on when you first put your foot down to provide a mechanical interface between your body and the environment. And it too is behaving as a brake, as a spring-like brake to actually cushion the interaction and make sure you don't sag too much, you don't give too much, but get, give just enough to prevent damage and to make the movement more efficient. And then that muscle very quickly turns into a motor to produce um, propulsion. So the point of, the, of, of this is, is that this, there are spinal networks, networks in the spinal cord, which actually program all of those patterns of activation. These are not coming down from the brain. They're actually being programmed within the spinal cord. So we've sort of already supported the thesis by saying the spinal cord does understand or represent uh, the properties of the body uh, and take an account of the physical, uh, of the physics of, of the movement itself. So if you would just remember this color code, I'm going to, um, I'm going to build on it. Don't worry, I'll be reminding you about it as we go along. One of the things I want to talk about is that when these muscles are acting as brakes, they're actually being lengthened at the same time as they're active. This is called active lengthening. Duh. Um, and Active lengthening is actually what I'm going to be um, focusing on for much of the rest of this. Oh, sorry. All right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to present uh, four quick vignettes that cover different aspects of the research that our lab has been involved in um, over the years. Um, and um, each one will just be a couple of slides just to give you some uh, flavor for what we've talked about. And each one will have a, a main message and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, um, about um, uh, what they consist of. And down here are some of the references that have resulted from this work. But to take a uh, sort of piggyback on, the, on what I just talked about in terms of the, um, of the, um, uh, the Inman slide, for the first vignette, during walking down a ramp, some muscles undergo active lengthening, serving as brakes rather than motors. So muscles can actually switch roles. And actually, saw the 
the ankle extensor switch roles during, during uh, ordinary locomotion. First, they act as brakes, uh, spring-like brakes to, to, uh, to interface with the ground, and then they act as motors to propel us. But these patterns can actually change depending on the motor task. The activation patterns that are required for different tasks are determined by spinal networks, which are informed by a body orientation signal from the brainstem. And I won't get into the details of that. It gets kind of um, complicated, but um, here's the, um, the, 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 the message from this part. So I had a postdoctoral fellow named Jindra Gottschall, Gottschall for um, a couple of years, and she wanted to do some work on this uh, control of locomotion. And what she did was, first of all, she verified some work that was already in the literature which had to do with the uh, programming of these three muscles during locomotion. Remember, we had the hip flexor, the limb retractor, and the ankle extensor. And she uh, duplicated in an interesting way some work from Judy Smith and her colleagues from the 1990s by showing that in the cat, at least, this is a little different from the human, but they're sort of similar, um, that during level walking, we have the swing phase and the stance phase, swing, stance, swing, stance. The ankle extensor muscle comes on during stance. We already talked about that. It's a brake and then a motor. The limb retractor comes on at the end of swing, as I was saying before, but then it's on during stance to provide propulsion by pushing the leg back, pulling the leg back. And then the hip flexor, as we talked about, causes a uh, flexion at the hip and uh, um, the initiation of the swing phase. It's uh, turned off during, uh, during stance because we don't want to flex at that time. But going downhill, we need more muscles to serve as brakes and spring-like brakes because what you're doing is going downhill is you're sort of, you're not trying to propel yourself, you're trying to break your fall, so to speak. And there's this really interesting switch that happens. This limb retractor just doesn't respond, doesn't come on during downhill walking, but the hip flexor does. The hip flexor here is trying to prevent the body from pitching forward as it's going downhill. All of that change in uh, programming occurs at the level of the spinal cord. What happens is there's some information coming down from the brain stem, from the vestibular system and other places which says to this, the pattern generating circuits, hey, you're going downhill now, so you've got to go into this new mode to accommodate this particular behavior. And this, um, this observation is, um, um, we'll be following up on that as we go along. Okay, that's vignette number one. Vietnam, vi vignette number two, sorry, um, is probably the more complicated one I'm gonna talk about. So please bear, bear with me. We'll try to get through it as quickly as possible. We talked about muscles that are acting as brakes as having spring-like properties. The question is, what are the mechanisms that give rise to those spring-like properties? They are, that they result actually from an interaction between the intrinsic muscle properties and the stretch reflex. Stretch reflex is diagrammed here made famous by Charles Sherrington in the early, late 1800s, early 1900s. There's a receptor called a muscle spindle that feeds back to the spinal cord, recruits motor units. And so when the, your the doctor taps your tendon, you get a little kick, which is the, the response to that length, uh, very short lengthening of the muscle. These are some of the, uh, the publications that have resulted from this work that talked about this interaction here. So let me tell you what I mean by an interaction between the intrinsic properties of muscle and the stretch reflex. The thing is back in the 70s, some people thought the stretch reflex really didn't do much of anything for motor control because it takes time for it to act. And the muscles are already have this spring-like property. So why do you need the stretch reflex? They already behave like springs, so why do you need it? Well, it's not quite true. Um, and this gets into some work um, that was... Uh, executed by this lady in the second row, uh, Clotilde Huig de Pointe. Um, if in an animal preparation, you, um, it, you, uh, you, you, you stretch a muscle with a constant velocity stretch like this, and the muscle is active, 
There's no reflex around, the muscle is active. It will initiate, initially resist that stretch just like a really good spring, but only for a short distance. After which the force then levels off, whereas a real spring, you would want the force to continue to rise like this. So there's a so-called short range of the muscle. And the reason for that short range is the little molecular machines that cause the, the force generation in the first place are work only over a very small range. And if you stretch the muscle too much and they're turning over slowly, particularly in a slow twitch muscle, they'll get mechanically disengaged causing this, this so-called yield here. Well, it turns out that the stretch reflex has already detected the fact that the muscle has been lengthened. And that muscle spindle receptor that we talked about then recruits new motor units and keeps the muscle behaving like a spring. I wanna go into that just a little bit more. So the muscle spindle receptor is a complicated receptor and we're not gonna talk about the details here, but it contains a collection of specialized muscle fibers that detect motion, particularly small motions. So when you first start stretching the muscle, this receptor records that, sends that information back to the spinal cord. What's going on in the spinal cord? Well, there are a collection of cells called motor neurons. These are the big spinal motor neurons that are gonna send information out and cause muscles to contract. And this is a fanciful depiction of Sir Charles Sherrington's view of the spinal motor pool. Um, it was actually, uh, put in the form of a stained glass window in the dining hall at Caius College, Cambridge University, where he was a professor. And what it represents is there are all of these spinal motor neurons and some of them are active and some of them are waiting in the wings, not activated yet, but almost activated. And so when the stretch reflex comes in, it causes more of these guys to join these guys and causes an increase in output from the spinal cord. So the fibers, these muscle fibers and their associated receptor detect the onset of muscle lengthening. Then the reflex circuit then leads to a recruitment of more motor units in anticipation of the impending yield or reduction in stiffness of the muscle. So that's basically the idea, but it gets even better. More of uh, Clotilde's work. The stretch reflex recruits motor units as needed to ensure a spring-like property of the muscle. So, and this is the case you've already seen where this is what the uh, muscle by itself would do and the stretch reflex comes in to continue the spring-like behavior beyond the short range. But during locomotion, you're actually shortening, lengthening, shortening, lengthening, shortening, lengthening. You're not just starting from a standstill. If you put a little bit of shortening in there, the reflex contribution gets a little bit less. And then if you go to the point where there's a lot of shortening and a lot of lengthening, which occurs during level walking, the stretch reflex doesn't do anything because actually the muscle now is behaving like a perfect spring. So there's this sort of interplay between the role of the neural pathways and the intrinsic properties of the muscle to ensure that in each and every case, the muscle um, exhibits a spring-like property. So the, the stretch reflex is most important during braking actions, which feature active lengthening as illustrated by these two cases. And during level walking, the yield and the stretch reflex are both reduced due to the prior shortening. So in a sense, the muscle spindle is predicting the extent of yield due to its own muscle properties. And, um, the work here I should uh, mention is, um, has been looked at at about the same time, Valerie Haftel, who was a graduate student of Tim Copes at Emory, uh, did a study where she was actually looking at the responses of the muscle spindles by recording from their sensory afferents during these different kinds of uh, manipulations. And she verified the fact that the muscle spindles are most active, become most excited by the lengthening in, this, in these cases here. And in these cases where you uh, have undergone some previous shortening, those muscle spindles, they still respond, but not, not nearly as vigorously. So in fact, it is the mechanical properties of the 
intrinsic of these uh, specialized muscle fibers that anticipate the action of the stretch reflex. So that what happens is, is that when you're walking along, your muscles behave like springs. And it's because of this really interesting um, uh, dynamic interaction between the intrinsic properties of muscle um, and, um, and the stretch reflex. Okay. Vignette number three. So that has to do with, we can understand how a single muscle exerts its spring-like properties. But the whole limb behaves like a big spring too. When we're running along, our whole limb is, is, is orchestrated in such a way that it behaves like a big suspension system for our bodies. Um, the apparent spring stiffness of the whole limb is regulated by the integration of the stretch reflex with sensory information from Golgi tendon organs, which are force receptors in muscles. These are Golgi tendon organs. The muscle spindles are up here somewhere. The tendon organs send information back to the spinal cord. And instead of ending directly on motor neurons, they actually uh, end on what we call interneurons that are processing information within the spinal cord. And they may cause either excitatory or inhibitory effects on the motor neurons. They're a little bit more complicated in, in, in the middle here. Uh, I should acknowledge the fact that the information from spindles and tendon organs is not only involves these particular circuits I'm talking about, the information sent up to the brain to give us a sense of kinesthesia, it's processed in more complex ways and so on and so forth. But we're sticking with a simple story here. I'm going to focus particularly on the inhibitory effects of the feedback from tendon organs uh, for reasons that I think will become obvious in a few minutes. Um, the study of this pathway from the tendon organs has occupied much of my career since the early 1990s. And so this is, uh, you know, represents some of the work that my students and postdocs and, and I have uh, really spent lots of late nights uh, thinking about. So. This figure over here, which is of a cat, not a human, uh, depicts the different muscles as springs. So we're not gonna worry about the fact that that spring-like business comes from an interaction of the intrinsic mechanical properties and the stretch reflex. That's all packaged and sort of like a little black box. But we can see that if you have a limb like this and you have these springs connected, that if you actually to build a model of this it would actually produce it would it would have a, a posture it would have it would it would have a posture and if you pushed on it like this it would actually behave like a big spring with all these muscles contributing um, their various contributions um oh that's interesting something happened to my slide here well uh there is a drawing behind this figure <laughs> um and what it shows is it's a figure from Tom McMahon, and it shows a diagram with a human lower limb, and superimposed upon it is a big spring and a and a big shock absorber, to to illustrate the fact that our limbs are like suspension systems. And he actually did some remarkable studies at Harvard University, where he was a professor, uh, experimenting with uh, the stiffness of the running track uh, in the athletic uh, field and show that the, the spring stiffness of the, um, of the human runner and the spring stiffness of the um, running track, if you match them correctly, and this is a thing called impedance matching as an engineering term, he could actually increase the speed of the runners by 4%, which was enough to break world records. So he was really into this idea of this uh, spring lake property. The only unfortunate part of it was, is that the athletic director called him up and said, uh, unfortunately, Tom, um, our running track has been disqualified from international comp uh, <laughs> competition. So anyway, so the, this figure depicts each muscle in situ with spring-like properties mediated by the intrinsic mechanical properties and the stretch reflex. And a lot of the mechanics here, this hides a lot of mechanical work done, uh, done by one of my former graduate students, John Lawrence, but um, we'll just uh, take the, the pictorial version for now. The entire limb will exhibit spring-like properties as a result. 
how is limb stiffness modified for different motor tasks, such as ramp walking? It turns out that, and uh, I consulted my engineering friends about this, if you're walking upstairs or up a ramp, what you want is propulsion and high stiffness because you want to get up and you don't want to be, you don't want to be uh, giving very much. When you're going downhill, you want more, uh, less stiffness or more compliance to make your limbs more like a suspension system to cushion the flow and gradually lower your, lower your body down. So how do we get the stiffness of this um, device to be changed? for these different tasks. And as a result of a lot of work from many people, um, Adam DeBoof was here, uh, Sir John Eccles from the 50s, uh, Steve Bonacera, Ronnie Wilmink, who is here as well, um, Tom Burkholder. Intermuscular inhibition from tendon organs and other receptors links muscles and muscle groups with inhibition. So when we talked about the stretch reflex, we talked about the muscle as if it's a little little uh, isolated little mechanism. The tendon organs in each muscle do talk to their parent muscle a little bit, but they mainly send information to other muscles through these inhibitory pathways. The excitatory pathway is in there as well, but I'm gonna focus on the inhibitory ones for the moment. So that means that we have big muscle groups that are linked by these inhibitory pathways. And it was the uh, brilliant insight of my thesis advisor, Jim Houck, back in the late 60s and early 70s, who said, isn't this interesting? You could take the excitatory effects of the muscle spindle through the stretch reflex and inhibitory effects from the Golgi tendon organ, and the integration of that would cause some balance point, which would determine how spring-like the muscle actually was, whether it's really stiff or very compliant. And his ideas were really talking about the control of a single muscle, but from the work uh, from uh, Eccles, which we didn't actually pay attention to back then, which was kind of silly, um, with all of these interjoint and intermuscular connections from the Golgi tendon organs, became very clear that these tendon organ pathways are actually concerned with the global mechanical properties of the limb rather than individual muscles. And so, but the, the, the original idea of Hauck was that stiffness is, uh, the stiffness of the spring is determined by a balance between excitation from spindle receptors and inhibition from tendon organs. Now, um, Mark Lyle, while he was a postdoc, did an enormous amount of work showing that um, the inhibition between muscle groups through what we thought was Golgi tendon organs is basically bi-directional. In other words, the quadriceps group talks to the tricep psori group or the ankle extensor group and vice versa. And that by and large, there's some variation in whether one direction is stronger than the other. And in fact, those different directionalities seem to have some physiological significance, but there's generally speaking kind of a balance between those muscle groups. So between the the knee extensors, the ankle extensors, and muscles crossing the metatarsal phalangeal joint. So um, it may be the, the strength of the inhibition may be biased differently, presumably for different motor tasks. And in fact, um, it was shown by uh, another student, Kyla Ross, that during locomotion during stepping on a level surface, there is a somewhat of a bias of inhibition from these muscles to these muscles and these muscles down to these muscles. In other words, a sort of a proximal to distal biasing of the inhibition. And that makes sense because these distal joints are the ones that interact with the ground and that's where you want the springiness to be in there. So the the proximal to distal gradient seems to be most appropriate, but still the inhibition is bidirectional. So that brings us to the final vignette, which is following spinal cord injury, alterations in body posture during locomotion may be due in part to changes in the distribution of intermuscular inhibition between muscles. 
and that training animals on sloped surfaces. So now I'm going to try to bring all of these threads together. Training animals on sloped surfaces return the organization of intramuscular inhibition and adaptability of the motor system to slope walk in to slope walking toward normal. And uh, this part of the project, uh, this part of the, the, the career is due mainly to this lady right here, Dina Howland, professor of neurological surgery at um, University of Louisville. Um, I hold her personally responsible for preventing me from retiring about 10 years ago. Um, she came to me with such an exciting proposal, I couldn't, uh, I, I, I couldn't refuse. She said, you've talked about these inhibitory pathways Maybe they have something to do with what's going on in these animals with spinal cord injury, because the, the, uh, it's the muscle spindle and, the, and its associated pathways that have been mostly blamed for problems uh, in, after a stroke and spinal cord injury, cerebral palsy, et cetera. The Golgi tendon organ really hasn't been considered that much. So we undertook a study, which has involved a number of students and, um, and two grants, one from the NIH and one from the, from the Veterans Administration to look into this. So what uh, uh, Dina and her group um, is currently being written up now by Lynette Montgomery, a former postdoc in her laboratory, that after hemisection, by hemisection, I mean, if you, this is a cross section of the spinal cord. If you make a cut, through the spinal cord like this, and here's the histology to show that one side of the spinal cord has been uh, injured. These animals do remarkably well. They can walk around, they have bladder and bowel control. Uh, they, uh, they enjoy uh, social, socializing with, their other, with the other animals. They, they have no trouble getting around and doing things, but they do have motor deficits. And the main deficit that was noticed that is after the hemisection, animals tend to crouch more during locomotion than animals without the injury. Um, plus the fact when these animals go into uh, slope walking, if they are encouraged to walk down slopes, the adaptations to down slope walking, uh, the increased yield and all of that that we talked about before, uh, these animals fail to adopt, to adapt themselves to that uh, pattern of slope walking. And it was verified that the crouching is not due to the fact that the muscles are simply weak due to the injury. So something else is going on here. And basically what we found was following the partial spinal cord injury, the stretch reflex was actually increased in a few muscles, but very, very slightly. And the stretch reflex, of course, would be ex expected to do just the opposite. It would tend to make the animals less crouched than even in the normal case. That was from uh, work by Elma Kaitas, a uh, former graduate student. Um, we found that the intramuscular inhibition is no longer balanced and consistently strong onto the extensor muscles of the ankle. That is, it was consistently strong onto the extensor muscles of the ankle. Instead of having balanced or this proximal to distal gradient, all of the inhibition was focused on these muscles here, the, the ankle extensor muscles, so that they are responsible for uh, plantar flexion at the ankle. And that may be a major reason why these animals were crouching more. So the excessive inhibition onto the ankle extensors may partially explain the pronounced flexion during locomotion. Um, Shay McMurtry just graduated last year showed that following eccentric or downslope training, that is these animals were then encouraged to walk down slopes on a regular basis during the week for anywhere from six to 12 weeks. Following that training, the organization of intramuscular inhibition returned toward normal, including more balanced inhibition, and within that balanced, more varied distributions that we found in animals that did not have uh, lesions. At the same time, members of the Howland lab showed that the trained animals showed adaptations to ramp walking that, un that untrained animals and those trained on level surfaces did not. In other words, this slope walking training was actually uniquely effective in that rehabilitation. I wanted to uh, 
feature. And of course, you know, we're, we're hoping maybe at some point the rehabilitation clinics might want to pick this idea up. And once patients are able to walk on treadmills and across ground, they can start to do other kinds of natural activities like going up and down stairs that might actually propel their recovery even more rapidly. Irm Niazi was a graduate, uh, is, was a um, PhD student who actually did the initial studies showing that there's something strange about the organization of this intramuscular inhibition following the, the, uh, the spinal, spinal cord injury. Uh, Elma Kaitez um, was um, sort of a next in line and she did a full blown, highly quantitative and rigorous study showing this change in the organization of the force feedback system. She's very talented with computers and computations and just did a fabulous job. This is Shay McMurtry, who uh, was the one who actually described the, the training effect. In fact, when animals came down from Louisville that had been trained, she was not told what their training status was. And she was virtually 100% effective in guessing their training status based on the physiology that we measured in our laboratory. Adam DeBoeuf has just graduated and um, Adam has taken a, a bit more of a basic track in which he has actually explored the receptor mechanisms of this intramuscular inhibition and, and showed that actually the Golgi tendon organ is not the only receptor that may be contributing to this. In addition to that, he has um, did some uh, fundamental studies about how the brainstem normally controls this, uh, this um, uh, feedback network in the spinal cord. And finally, Thendral Govindaraj, who is a mechanical engineering um, uh, PhD student co-advised by Greg Sawicki and me, is uh, doing a computational study on a computer to, make the, to try to establish the cause and effect relationship between a change in the pattern of this in intramuscular inhibition and the resulting changes in the function of the, of the system. Further acknowledgements. Um, the main one to start with is, of course, Craig and Joy Lynch. Um, I worked with them for, for years when I was chair of applied physiology. They've been steadfastly contributing to the MSPO program and also to the School of Applied Physiology and now to the program in applied physiology. And I thank them from the bottom of my heart for their unwavering support uh, to, uh, to all of our, our efforts. Uh, I can't possibly acknowledge everybody that I'd like to, there just wasn't room enough on the page. So um, many of you have, have contributed greatly to this work and you know, directly or indirectly. Um, I wanted to give a, a shout out to Mark Neeson and Adam Davis, two undergraduate students who have been spending long, long hours helping us uh, collect data and doing their own studies. Uh, from the Howland Laboratory, Lynette Montgomery, Ray Van Sant and Will Brostein, were individuals who actually uh, transported animals in their cars down to Atlanta and, and, and sat through these really long experiments. We have a veterinary collaborator, Richard Noel, here on campus who uh, uh, increased the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the success of our experiments by doing all sorts of things with uh, physiological um, adjustments. Uh, faculty colleagues, uh, Rick Siegel, Mike Saka, I wanted to mention. Of course, my family, uh, Gareth and Sean, the two boys and their children. And tremendous number of staff members who have been uh, incredibly um, supportive and made all this work, um, all this work happen over the years. Um, Mary Barron, Ted Evans, and Chris Shoup, and Laura O'Farrell from the uh, veterinary, from the physiological research laboratory in the Iacook have been wonderful colleagues as well. So we're not over yet. One last thing. Uh, Ragnar Granit uh, was a Nobel Prize winning uh, neuroscientist uh, from Sweden who uh, got his Nobel Prize for his work in the visual system, but he actually worked with Sir Charles Sherrington uh, for some years. And um, he was asked to write a review of his work in the Annual Review of Physiology in 1972. And he said, I, I can't, I've, you know, I've got, I've written all these books. You can read about my work anywhere you want, but I, what I wanna do is give some advice. And this paper that he wrote has been um, really a guiding post for me 
uh, over the years. It's called discovery and understanding. So Lewis, if you're listening, I'm gonna use understanding in its proper context now. Um, his thesis was that discoveries are nice and they propel science, but the real purpose of science is understanding. It is not making discoveries. And he talked about two famous individuals, uh, Sir Charles Sherrington and uh, Charles Darwin. And he said, you know what? Those two never actually made a discovery. They actually took existing work. They added their own very careful detailed observations, which were far more sophisticated than anybody else had done. And they wove these into a global theory about how the world works. And he said, these were not discoveries. They were actually uh, required years of introspection and thinking and synthesis of information. And so uh, he said, yes, discoveries are important. I mean, you got to get a grant, you got to get a position, you got to get, yeah, yeah, you got to write a paper. Discoveries are important. But without that time to pull that information together and synthesize it, that's, that's really what the, the, the whole um, uh, enterprise of science is all about. And he gets into some really prescient uh, uh, material here. He says, you know, we bicker about, we argue about who thought up which, uh, who was the discoverer of this particular idea or that particular um, uh, fact or this particular technique. And we quibble about who did this and who did that and who did that. He said, if everybody's just interested in, in, um, in the synthesis of information and putting this together, these ideas, this bickering actually becomes completely meaningless because that's not what science is really about. And I think that is uh, something, obviously that's a kind of an extreme viewpoint. Everybody who's going into science is trying to make their, 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 uh, their mark and, and so forth. But I think it's really important to, uh, to keep this in mind that what we're really talking about is that science is a is an enterprise that involves a lot of people with a lot of thinking, and it's really that synthesis that is the uh, the most um, important aspect of the whole thing. Not to mention what the uh, taxpayer is paying for. Okay, so I thank you very much for your attention, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Richard, for a wonderful uh, talk. I, I, we do have some time for some questions, and uh, we'd also like to open up to any comments that if anybody would like to make um, as well uh, directly to Richard. So. Richard, uh, um, wonderful talk. When you recruited me, to, uh, you and Tim recruited Emory about 24 years ago, I look at you two and you really don't look like you've changed my variety. <laughs> <laughs> and I, so this question is uh, about aging and spring that is the muscle and why my springs seem to not be as good anymore uh, in terms of walking uh, where you guys seem to just be perpetu in perpetual motion so what do you think um, changes in terms of muscle spring-like properties with aging that like a stretch reflex thing? connected tissue and, no and but how does that how no. does the stretch reflex does the stretch reflex adapt to deal with the fact that the muscle changes its spring like properties. Right, right. So um, people, when they get to be at a certain age, um, <laughs> actually, and uh, Eddie, correct me if I'm wrong, but but apparently uh, people have more difficulty going downstairs and upstairs, even though their muscles were losing muscle mass. Um, and we may be not as strong as we were um, some time ago. It's actually going down downstairs, and this this comes from uh, from uh, Roger Anoka, uh, who's an authority in the field. Um, it turns out that these lovely little stretch receptors and muscles deteriorate. They actually begin to atrophy along with uh, extrafusal muscle fibers. So you actually lose the the capacities of these uh, spinal pathways as well. And that's one of the problems why uh, the spring in your step seems, to, and then connected tissue. Richard. So, Richard, I have 
I owe you a debt as well. I mean, you're the one who really got me interested in understanding the real basics of physiology as someone who came from primarily a rehabilitation background. So thank you so much for that. And one of the things that I was struck by was, so in the rehabilitation literature, there does seem to be evidence that afferent activation through things like stimulation helps to augment the effects of training. And so I was struck by your evidence that during the downslope walking, there's more the spindle activity, which is primarily excitatory. It has that direct connection to the motor neuron. And I was thinking, oh, well, that's why they have a, a larger training effect when they're walking downslope. But then you suggested that it was actually inhibition. So I wondered if you could resolve that. Well, well, the thing is, it's it's the it's the it's not. The fact of how of the fact that there is excitation and inhibition, it's a, it's a matter of how much. So it's the um, the training of that proper balance of inhibition and excitation that is what results in the in the uh, return toward the the normal. So it may be it's probably a reduction. So some muscles receive far too much inhibition, other muscles receive far too little after the injury. So it's actually renormalizing that to get to more of a balance. And by the way, your own PhD work was a prodigious exercise in basic science, if I might remind you, with Paul Stein. So um, I think um, it's 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 not that you're trying to get to, to train more in a bit. You're trying to actually restore that that proper balance between the two. If that answers the question, I'm not sure. Sort of. Yeah, Lux. Hey, sir. Um, it's cool to see all your work in like one presentation uh, puts a lot of things in context. And I guess that's sort of an existential question, which is a little broader. Uh oh. <laughs> I mean, you know, since you're talking about understanding, I guess. So you showed this really, whether it's a single muscle, where the stretch reflex, you know, brings the springiness back, or whether it's in your cats, where, you know, if you've lost the reflexes, they're crouching, and if you train them, they get this back. So you've shown the effect of reflexes and what they do, but you've shown them these tasks which are pretty like steady state and unchanging, right? So the existential question is like, why in these sort of steady tasks like walk in flat ground or something where you know what's going to happen, you've done it for years and years and years, why do you even, why does the body even depend on reflexes there? Like why, why can't the, you just control it differently? Like if you know you're crouching, why doesn't the cat just stimulate it more or something like that? Sure. Okay, so uh, that's a great question. So the, the question has to do with the fact that uh, for these sort of repetitive actions, and we're trying to get more towards natural movements where you're just doing all kinds of things, but during these repetitive tasks, um, the brain's pretty smart. And why doesn't it anticipate all of these things? And we did an experiment accidentally once we, um, because of a technique that, and I, I meant to make more of this before, uh, a technique that, that Tim Cope introduced, introduced us to, which is also accidental on his part. That is, if you surgically cut a nerve to a muscle and repair it, the muscle ends up being perfectly normal, except it has no stretch reflex. And there's a whole story there with Travis here and, and Paul and, you know, um, and uh, Lena, um, and you know, a bunch of pe people have contributed to this, but um, we use this, those, uh, those uh, figures that I showed from Clotilde's work where she showed how a muscle behaves with and without the reflex, those were done using that technique. So one muscle was re -innervated, and so it didn't have a stretch reflex and the other one was fully. And the thing is we did those experiments in animals um, we maybe uh, you know did a, a one muscle group where we re innervated the muscles and it takes about nine months to get the animal back into going uh, back into service again where they can um, where they can actually um, use those muscles again because they have to regenerate into the muscle. That one animal in particular, we had him in the um, in the animal facility, uh, uncaged of course, for four years. And he never ever learned how to correct his um, posture going downhill. He had this excessive yield because we had eliminated the stretch reflex during this down ramp walking. And it never recovered 
one iota. And I think the reason for that is, is because when a muscle, remember I said at the beginning that a muscle becomes activated and whether it behaves as a, as a motor or a spring has to do with how it's loaded. So in other words, it's the outside world that's determining the function of that muscle under those conditions. And the animal never ever learned to do some fancy compensation thing to avoid this excessive yield. Now, of course, you can say, yeah, but you know, what was the, what was the, uh, uh, what was the pressure for that animal to do that? I mean, the animals didn't fall over; they succeeded, and so you, that's a, a legitimate, um, a legitimate uh, um, uh, objection. However, many people told us these animals are going to live perfectly fine. They, they're going to adapt to this in a matter of a few months. You're never going to notice anything, and in fact. When they're walking on a level ground, you'd never notice anything was wrong with them. We stood, took a, a whole study section, an investigation team over to the lab to demonstrate this phenomenon. They said, you're not gonna see anything. We'd never actually done the experiment. We did it at a site visit. Put the animals on the ramp, put the food at the top of the ramp. The animals ran right up with no problem. Put the food at the bottom of the ramp. They went down the ramp and blew this big yield, even after four years. So anyway, that's my... Uh, not quite completely satisfactory answer to your question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think